My name is Manal Makloufi. I live in Damarie Lelis. I'm Muslim and French at the same time. I've been wearing the veil for almost a year. I studied my religion, I did some research, and the desire to wear the veil started to grow in me. Manal Makloufi's veil is an expression of her devotion to Islam. The Quran instructs women to dress modestly, and for Manal, that means wearing a headscarf whenever she's outside the home. Eighteen, in her last year of high school, she lives in a small town on the outskirts of Paris called damarie les lys Like many low-income suburbs, it's home to a large immigrant population from France's former North African territories. They are from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and most are Muslim. They are transforming the landscape. The France we thought we knew. Is no longer the France that is. <laughs> With about five million Muslims, France has the largest Muslim community in Western Europe. As their numbers grow, so do tensions. Hate crimes against Muslims are on the rise. Au lendemain des incendies volontaires qui ont ravagé une salle de prière à Seno de la mosquée d'Annecy. In the last year, at least five imams have been expelled from France for preaching radical interpretations of the Quran. But more than anything else, it's the veil that seems about to rip France apart. Reports of girls wearing headscarves in public schools have become a staple of the media in recent years. France's new law banning headscarves, which took effect in September 2004, is forcing girls like Manal to make a choice, the practice of their faith or their education. For the moment, Manal lives in damarie les lys as a very French and Muslim teenager. Let me introduce you to my mom. Manal's parents came from Morocco. This is my universe. It's my room. It's a mess because I have exams coming up. This is my Quran translated into French because I haven't mastered Arabic well enough to read the Quran in Arabic. Before school each day, she picks out a veil to wear. This one was brought back to me by my grandmother from Mecca. And this one was also brought back to me from Mecca. I buy the other ones at the market. I've got quite a few. If I like the color, I choose that one. It also depends on what I wear. It has to match. You can't mix. In France, religion is a private matter, off limits in public institutions, especially in schools. By wearing a symbol of her faith to school, Manal and girls like her are challenging a pillar of the French Republic, a separation of church and state dating back to the French Revolution, when the reign of kings who claimed divine rights was ended on the guillotine. And a republic was founded governed not by God, but by laws of the people. In 1905, the principle of secularism was codified into law. Almost a hundred years later, 
The principal of Manal's public high school believes it's her role to uphold these cherished ideals. Her name is Ghislaine Bonjour. Hudson. Bonjour. Public school is where French citizens are created. We have a mission, we have a role to spread the values that seem the most important. Liberty, equality, fraternity, and secularism. Since the law on secularism, school is a public space where the presence of religious signs has no place among the young in their formative years. So it's the place, the time in one's life when people learn to live together, learn to know each other, learn to understand each other. And that's why it's so symbolic. Until recently, it's been up to principals to decide how to discipline veiled students. Nationwide, more than 1,200 girls wore headscarves to school last year, and only four were expelled. The growing number of Muslim girls wearing veils to school is part of a disturbing trend, according to National Assembly member Jacques Mihar. In fact, the veil is just a facade for something that goes deeper. Gender equality is being challenged, refusing to have a female teacher if you're a male, refusing to go to the pool because you'll have to undress, and not being able to pray during classes. A whole mental process is being launched. Everyone must learn that there's a religious and a public realm, and that public life is ruled by the laws of the Republic, not by religious laws. In 2003, as Muslim demands for recognition grew louder, French President Jacques Chirac appointed a commission to study ways to protect the nation's secular system. No. Ghislaine Hudson was a member. The commission concluded the best way to diffuse the pressure from Islamic groups was to take steps to put Muslims on equal footing with the rest of the population. It made 26 recommendations including a new national religious holiday for Muslims, teaching Arabic in public schools, and the eradication of urban ghettos. But President Chirac only accepted one of the commission's suggestions, the banning of all overt religious symbols from public schools. Last December, he proposed a new law. I believe that the wearing of clothing or signs that ostensibly manifest a religious affiliation must be forbidden in public schools, elementary, middle, and high schools. While Chirac's law also prohibits Jewish skull caps and large Christian crosses, it was widely understood to be aimed at Islam and the veil. Thousands took to the streets of Paris, charging that the law was discriminatory, a form of racism, and an attack on freedom of religion. They defended the veil as personal choice, not an obligation forced on them by family. News of the law reverberated around the globe. وأشدد وأضع ثلاثة خطوط حمراء تحت تضمن حرية المعتقد وتضمن حرية ممارسة الشعائر الدينية. Ghislaine Hudson went on Al Jazeera to explain the law to the Arab world. The law has become a cause célèbre in France and has polarized the nation. It was impossible to have dinner or meet friends without arguing over these things. Families were divided and torn, friends split, 
lovers divorced. It was a time when people were really passionate. Even Ghislaine Hudson's American-born husband, Kent, has doubts about the law. Uh, really, I mean, the, why in the world would you expect somebody to wear the same kind of hat you wear? You know, why would you pass a law to tell women what to put on their heads? In an effort to keep one of her top students in school, Principal Hudson has worked out a compromise with Manal. For the rest of the school year, she can wear a head cover in the hallways and a bandana in class. When I arrive at school, I have to wear something tied at the back of my neck. When I enter my classroom, I have to wear something. So underneath, I wear my bandana. I'd feel extremely uncomfortable without anything on my head in class. I hope they won't ask me to take it off. I got more interested in my religion after my father's death. At first, I was very angry. I was blaming others. Becoming more involved in my religion helped me to accept my father's death and to go on with my life on this earth. I talked about it with my mom, and she explained to me that if I wanted to wear the veil, I'd have to really think about it, and that if I started wearing it, it'd be forever. And from one day to the next, we were supposed to go out, and I went out with my veil, and I've been wearing it non-stop ever since. Her mind is made up. The most important thing to me between the French state and my religion is my religion for sure. I won't do things which contradict my religion or jeopardize my place in heaven. I hope there won't be any problems. It'd be stupid to waste my education and the education of other bright girls because of this. How can this little thing of a headscarf create such a problem? Only the French, right? Besma Lauri is a journalist, a freelance writer for L'Express magazine in Paris. For nearly two years, she's been reporting on the rise of Islam in France. France woke up one morning and realized there were millions of Muslims on its land, and that these millions of people had religious demands. We started wondering what this world was, who these people were. The largest community in France is of Algerian origins, like me. I feel perfectly and completely part of French culture. It's my language, the language I speak. I have a perfect knowledge of French history. Lauri is a perfect example of French integration. She was born to Algerian parents but grew up mostly in Paris. She studied at one of the nation's finest universities, the Sorbonne. Don't put on your blinker, you'd hurt your hand. It's so annoying. In her reporting, she's able to understand both cultures. The question is, how do we live together with a large population who's essentially North African and Muslim? It creates a conflict, and a conflict is when two people can't understand each other. There's the French, whether it's the state or the school, who say that the minority should bend to the majority, not the reverse.
The minority conforming to the majority sums up the French notion of integration. But these days, the children and grandchildren of immigrants who refuse to assimilate can be found everywhere. <laughs> Karima Naour is a member of the Muslim Scouts of France. The veil is inevitably associated with a foreign country. So here I come with my foreign background. But they shouldn't talk about integration. It's over. Integration was for our parents. Why should we integrate when we were born in France? We have French papers. We speak French. We went to French schools. We're registered voters. Why are we talking about integration? Apparently, because our parents weren't born here, we should try to integrate. But integration has to go both ways. If we try to integrate, then people have to accept us. Being born here, having French papers, I don't understand why I should try to integrate. Some are paying a price for standing out. We feel the repercussions on the street all the time. Girls having their headscarves pulled off, insults. Some girls have even been attacked physically. The veil is a religious symbol, which for many is also a political symbol. We forget to mention it, but it's political. It's a symbol of Iran, of Khomeini. It's also perceived as contempt for women. And France is France. It's May 68. It's the feminists. It's women who fought to be free, to have control over their bodies, and to have contraception. It's that too. So now we're going to see Halil Maroon, who's the rector of the Great Mosque of Evry. Halil Maroon is quite an important person in Islamic France. It'll be interesting to hear what he thinks about this. My dear sisters, if you look at the ones who target Islam, they don't target Islam through men. They couldn't care less about men. They try to target Islam through women. A big minaret. That's really rare. Khalil Maroun's mosque here in Evry is one of the largest in France. Just 18 miles from Paris, it's a scene straight out of North Africa. More than 5,000 people come to Friday prayers here. Islam is now France's second largest religion after Catholicism. Lahori has come to interview Maroon to ask about the growing appeal of Islam to the young and the symbolism of the veil. What I'd like to understand is why, in your opinion, do people have this need to distinguish themselves through clothing, to show off their faith? I think there are a few reasons. French society rejects them and doesn't give them a chance to integrate. So if they take refuge in Islam, it's because... It's because they can't find their place in French society. The veil isn't the real question. I think that politicians who are in government today have invented this law to distract public opinion from the real problems. It's unemployment. It's the plight of the children of immigrants who are being asked to integrate when they're third generation and they were born here. Thirty-year-old Haji Kirksu is the son of Turkish immigrants. 
He teaches in Principal Hudson's high school in its vocational department. He is one of the few teachers in the school who believes the ban on the veil is discriminatory. I think that this law is useless. Some girls come to school in mini skirts, some in shorts, some veiled. What's the problem? The teacher's goal is to share his knowledge and his expertise. Let's not mix politics and education. In France, public schools are seen as the social leveler, where everyone gets a fair shot. But like lower-income minority populations in the United States, the system here seems to be failing many Muslim students. Most of Kirksu's students are the children of immigrants. They've fallen off the academic track and are training to be electricians. It's true that in my own high school, people are rather separated. On one hand, we have general education, where the majority are Franco-French, with fortunately some exceptions like Manal and others. On the other hand, we have vocational education where a large proportion of the young people are the children of immigrants. So it's a kind of segregation. It's visible to the naked eye. You can't hide it. As a teacher, it's true that I have a lot of foreign and Muslim students. And it's true that because their names are Mohammed or Ibrahim, they really have a hard time looking for work. I've been looking for a job for at least four or five years. I can't find a steady job. People aren't really hot about Arab names, especially when you come from Demarie Lelis. Around here, when you say Demarie, we're really perceived as thugs from the hood. When I send in a resume, my name is, say, Rashid Benziad or something, it stops right there. But if I had sent it under the name of Francois Dupont, it would have made it. It happened to me not long ago. What do you want me to do about it? As a teacher, Kirk Su could afford to live in a middle-class neighborhood. But he's decided to raise his family among Damarie Lelis immigrant population. In France, these high rise public housing projects are becoming ethnic ghettos. Some of my colleagues ask me questions like, Why did you buy here? You shouldn't buy at the Plan de Lis. That's my house on the second floor. In fact, I was nervous. They told me so many bad things. If you park here, not too far away from school, your car might be set on fire. The media often reports on drugs, crime, and violence in the projects. Damarie Lelis has had its fair share of attention. What's less reported is that up to 30% of the young people living in these neighborhoods are unemployed, more than twice the French national average, according to some studies. <clears throat> the problem is that today we see young people who have trouble finding work. It's like my 19-year-old daughter. They give her work for one day because her name is Nasima. I told my wife, maybe we should have called her Isabel. French rap music is giving voice to frustrations in the projects.
Bloc pas sur les ondes, la rattaille. Ça passe sur Sky ou pas, c'est 100% rack. Vitry 9-4, tard le soir, on smoke. Tu me crois pas C'est un, un quartier dans lequel. This is a neighborhood which shouldn't have any social problems. But it's true that in all neighborhoods in France, and maybe in the world, there are a few individuals who cause problems. Jean-Claude Mignon has been the mayor of damarie les lys for more than 20 years. He inherited the ghetto and its housing projects, built 35 years ago for temporary guest workers brought to France during an economic boom. You can see in the distance the roofs of the old American factory, ideal standard. And today it's a factory that's been abandoned since the 1970s. There were something like 3,000 to 4,000 people who worked in that factory. This population stayed until now. They had children and their children are still here. To minimize problems in the neighborhood, Mayor Mignon is planning to relocate some people living in the projects into new housing by the River Seine. As part of a national urban renewal program, he is overseeing a massive project, renovating some buildings, demolishing others. It's a building with 200 apartments. The building is too dilapidated to be renovated efficiently. We're not going to blow it up. There won't be an explosion. We'll simply take it apart to avoid traumatizing the families who spent more than 30 years of their life in this building. But for some of the young men living here, better housing won't solve the problems they face on the margins of French society. The problem is in architecture. We're not one of their own. If I have a kid, I like taking care of my kid more than someone else's kid. We're not their children. We don't share the same background. We're French, we were born here. But we're not French by blood. I don't feel French. Me neither. For me, it's too difficult. Even historically, it's impossible. These young men were not even born in the 1950s and 60s, when their parents and grandparents struggled to free their countries from the bonds of French colonialism. Perhaps the most bitter conflict was the Algerian War of Independence, which cost tens of thousands of lives. Three years ago, France and Algeria met again on the soccer field. It was the first match the old colonial power had ever played against its former colony. Emotions were running high. It was an incredibly important event. It stood for the reconciliation between the two countries. The whole French government was there. That's how strong a symbol this was. And we quickly realized that the French national anthem was being booed. They were young French of Algerian descent who were booing the Marseillaise. It was just terrible. Twelve minutes before the match is over, it looks like France is about to win. And then the field was invaded with hundreds of young French with their Algerian flags. The match was abandoned. The whole French government was there, in shock. No one reacted. We thought, in fact, they're not happy here. And the French government's inertia was perceived as the failure of 30 years of immigration policy in France. That was a tremendous blow. Let's say that young people woke up. We feel like we lost our religion, our culture. 
We were a little lost. We didn't know who we were anymore. We didn't feel at home here. And we wanted to recapture our culture, our religion, our language. We want to go back to our roots. In an age of terror, returning to their Muslim roots creates even more problems for these men because many in France now fear them as potential terrorist recruits. I think that something changed, because first of all, there was September 11th. We realized that among the people involved in September 11th and in terrorist networks, there were people who came from here, from France. For instance, Zacharias Moussaoui, a French citizen, is allegedly the 20th hijacker in Al-Qaeda's original 9-11 plot. Nearly a dozen other French citizens have been detained or arrested on terrorism charges in 2004 alone. There's a feeling in Damerie Les Lys, like everywhere else, that we're affected by what's happening at the international level. These are pleasant messages, right? Here, bin Laden is an example. They're more and more convinced that bin Laden is leading a just battle against society, against the Jews, against Israel and its allies. And it's also a religious battle. These are young people who watch TV. They see what's going on in the Middle East. They see the War of Stones, the Intifada, the Jihad. I was stunned to discover that they had given me the name of the current Israeli Prime Minister, Sharon. It's extraordinary. I'm not Jewish myself, although if I were, it wouldn't be a problem. It's extraordinary. There's bin Laden and me. I represent power. I represent Sharon. Trying to placate the growing Muslim population in damarie les lys Mayor Mignon has granted a permit for construction of a mosque after resisting demands for many years. Most of France's practicing Muslims still cram into small makeshift prayer rooms. Besides providing a comfortable place to worship, the new mosque will also allow the mayor to keep an eye on potential extremists. The fears that we had, and still have, are to know what type of imam will come here to do his sermons and take care of the prayers. And that's a worry. It's a worry that's not exclusive to Damarie Les Lys. It's a worry that's national and international. But I prefer that it happens this way, that it happens in a mosque, seen as a mosque, rather than happening in a clandestine way, in basements. I think there's a fear, a psychosis. There's a fear of Islam, and they're trying to scare the whole society with this psychosis. I think Islam is a misunderstood religion. Adding to this fear, more and more non-Muslims are seeing their own children convert to Islam as many as 50,000 so far, according to a recent government report. I first met Islam through my friends at middle and high school. I was always close to Arabs and Africans who are Muslims. Conversion to Islam requires just a simple statement of faith in God in the presence of a witness. You want to convert to Islam. You know that knowledge is very important in Islam. 
Adoring God in ignorance would lead us to fundamentalism. First of all, listen to your heart. Are you ready? I am. Take a deep breath and lift your right index finger. You know it. I'll see how you pronounce the Arabic. The important thing is to know the meaning. Say, Bismillah. So what does it mean? Can you tell me? It means that I testify that there's only one God and no other divinity, and that Muhammad is the messenger sent by God. Did you choose a name? Yeah, Reda. Reda. You told me that it goes well with Rudy. I'm staying close to the original. That's it, Reda. Let me kiss you. It's our tradition to kiss our children. I'm French and Muslim. Why can't we be French and Muslim at the same time? It's the very word Muslim that shocks these days. Soon in books it's going to be written, Muslim equals terrorist. In France, we're afraid of Islam because we're being shown the bad Islam. People who fight, organize bombings, behead people in public or on TV in the name of Islam. They're the opposite of the Quran. That's not what Islam is all about, and that's what frightens people. Islam is widely viewed with suspicion in France, and that's not making life any easier for the millions of moderate French Muslims. I think that the Quran is truly God's words. I'm a believer. I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm not a terrorist. Unfortunately, in France, it's all put in the same bag. And if I wore a beard, they'd ask, is he a fundamentalist? Is he a terrorist? It shouldn't be that way. School teacher Aji Kirksu had to struggle to find his place in French society. His parents emigrated from Turkey 30 years ago and settled with about 300 other Turks in a small rural village outside Dijon, close to a textile mill. It's not Turkish coffee. It's regular coffee. It's American coffee, right? No, not even. We don't buy American. I'm French. I drink French. That's French coffee. Kirk Sue is one of a minority of French Muslims who pursued higher education. Though he finished his master's degree with high honors, the road wasn't easy. I'm doing well because I studied for a long time. I have many friends who have become doctors, architects, engineers, teachers, professors in prestigious engineering schools in France. We shared the same ideas. But there's always something in the way. Unfortunately, finding a job was horrible. 
My brother succeeded because he didn't worry about his religion or his name. He told himself, I can go further, and he succeeded. It's not like that for all our friends. They all ended up as simple workers, but not my brother. He didn't let his religion stop him. He put himself in the skin of a Frenchman while living the two cultures. If I have one piece of advice for the young, it's don't neglect your studies. The more diplomas you have, the more you'll get ahead. Even if you have difficulties during your school years, you'll get ahead with your diplomas. Like Kirk Sue, Manal Makloufi is one of the top students at her high school and is preparing for France's competitive baccalaureate exam, taken by any student wishing to go on to university. Physical education is one of the tests. After graduation, she hopes to attend medical school. With the school year ending, Principal Hudson calls in her gifted student to review their awkward compromise over Manal's veil and discuss her plans for the future. So, Manal, I'm happy that you've come to see me. Let's talk a little bit about this year, since it was an unusual year. Was it difficult for you? Yes, very difficult. Even now I'm going along with it against my will. How do you see your future at this moment? I'd like to get into medical school, be successful in my studies, and not have it be a barrier for me, not close any doors for me. Here I'm expanding the boundaries of school principal, but you have to think about the woman you'll be and the environment in which you'll work. What kind of doctor do you want to be? Either a pediatrician or a doctor for women. So, gynecologist? No, a general practitioner, but for women. A general practitioner for women only? Yeah, just Muslim women who don't have the option of going to see a male doctor. You see, this frightens me a little, but that's the gist of our conversation. Take me, for example. I consider myself a principal for both boys and girls at school, and I don't see myself as being a principal of just black people, white people, yellow people, men or women. That's what scares me a little. So, now you're getting ready to start medical school. You're entering into the adult world. The advice I'd like to give you is to be the most independent woman possible and to choose your own future as much as possible. Up to now, that's what I've done. Now listen, Manel, I wish you lots of luck. All of a sudden, we're in different worlds. Is it a failure? It's not the fact that she's Muslim. It's the fact that there's an established order in which she remains stuck, and which states, women go see women, or women wear a veil. And on that level, as a woman and as an educator, I cannot join her. The more you attack headscarves, the more headscarves you'll have. Laws of exclusion won't help us live together. School reopened in September 2004, and France seemed to be on a collision course. In an open challenge to the government, some Muslim leaders called for the girls to defy the ban, 
promising legal and private tutoring for those expelled. The Republic vowed to stand firm. I prefer facing a crisis today and enforcing a law, with some friction and some difficulties, over facing a civil war tomorrow. You heard me. I said tomorrow, a civil war.